The February jobs report doing nothing to assuage investor fears. The S&P 500 now down 3% as of Friday afternoon. For more on the markets, let's hear from Paul Kleinschmidt. He's a portfolio manager at Tocqueville Asset Management. Paul, uh, welcome. I know the Thank jobs report. <laughs> great to have you with us. I know the jobs report survey was taken in mid-February, which is before I guess uh, we had these deaths here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. due to the coronavirus. But why did the market shrug it off so well? We saw the markets down in the futures, then spike up after the report. Then by the time the market opened, down. So. Well, I think the short answer is that the market is forward-looking. That these reports weren't dealing with the situation that we find ourselves in now. And I think, moreover, that the coronavirus fears are fears that are both expressing d uncertainty in supply and in demand, <laughs> which is unusual. Usually it's one of the two. But between supply chains and between what's happening in major cities, I think people are having a very difficult time discounting what the future is going to look like. Well, that investor skittishness has driven the U.S. 10-year benchmark bond down at 0 0.695 today, another uh, all-time low. Would you recommend that some, I, I know it's supposed to be for safety, but right. it's also looking risky at this point. Uh, should some investors consider unloading or uh, lightening up on treasuries? So we were talking earlier, and I, they're supposed to be uh, risk-free rates of return. And I think these days they're actually rate-free units of risk. So I, I'm not so sure that that is an area that I would be spending much time on. In fact, it, the only thing I can think of is, is that if we had clients that had a lot of exposure there, that they'd maybe take some gains. But for the most part, our clients are in uh, short-term duration kind of fixed income securities, and that's where we would be because when this turns, it's going to be rather stark and it's going to be rather ugly. Now, I don't know when that will be. You could have said the same thing two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. But still, it's true. It's just a, it's just a question of when. Well, Paul, I was reading your note, and you talked about how with index funds, ETFs, you're talking about the indiscriminate selling of some stocks because they happen right. to be, say, in the S&P 500. So, which I guess implies that there are some good values out there now among individual stocks. And if so, what are you picking up? Yes and no. Again, I... I, I I would be lying if I said I know where the bottom is. And so, you know, it's possible that there's another leg down from where we are right now. But it's also true that any time you think that their baby is being thrown out with the bathwater, that you start looking around at some opportunities. And what are those? So, I mean, I think one that is really appealing to me is Disney. Uh, it's a name that I've owned for a while. And that's generally where I like to start in times like this with the names I already own rather than looking at new names. And um, I think that Disney is pretty compelling, notwithstanding the fact that people are probably not likely to spend a lot of time in movie theaters and probably or not theme parks. Like, or theme parks for that matter. But those, that will change. They will reopen. And frankly, with Disney Plus, Disney has the ability to release those movies direct and to home, maybe for $50 if things get bad enough, right? So they now have a distribution channel, which maybe that's, that's something they do. I don't, I don't know. I don't, they haven't mentioned that. But for the most part, this is a business now that is trading below where it was trading before the successful launch of Disney+. Plus. So it might be a bit disingenuous to say you're getting that business completely for free at these levels, but you're not paying much for it, if anything at all. And also probably uh, capitalizing on the stay-at-home phenomenon when you're talking about uh, streaming. I saw I was yeah. looking at Disney stock. That thing is off 26% from its peak in November. I, yeah, that's right. And yeah. and I think that the other thing I'd add is that Bob Iger's departure wasn't as sudden as people think. In fact, it's not a departure <laughs> until 2021. Right. I think the person that's him replacing him, Chapek, is a guy who is very data-oriented. So in my mind, I think of this a little bit... Uh, like the transition from Steve Jobs to Tim Cook, which is that you have a really good sound operator who's been in different parts of the businesses along his long career there, and he's really data-driven and focused on data-driven outcomes. And so I think that the, the company is likely to be in good hands, and, and again, Iger is going to be there with his hand on the wheel at least strategically and at least creatively for the next you know year or so. All right. Okay, thanks a lot, Paul, for giving us your thoughts and tips. Our thanks to Paul Kleinschmidt, of Tocqueville Asset Management. I'm Fred Kantayama. Have a wonderful weekend. This is Royce.